very warm welcome to Dr. Konstantinos Farsalinos of Greece to the Snooze Revolution, a THR Smart Solution podcast. Uh, we are very honored to have you here today. And uh, could you please present yourself with a little more details to the listeners all over the world? Yeah, um, I'm a physician and a public health expert with um, a lot of work on uh, tobacco harm reduction, mainly that's my field of um, expertise in terms of research. I've, uh, I initiated research on tobacco harm reduction through e-cigarettes in late 2011. At that time, it was a relatively new thing in Greece. And uh, my motivation was basically two friends of mine who initiated the cigarette use at a time when um, I knew nothing about them. So my first reaction was in reality that they wasted their time to a useless product and um, that I could prescribe them some varenic if they, if they really wanted to quit smoking. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, just by seeing my reaction, they persisted uh, by sending me more photos from them, of themselves using the e-cigarette. And that's what sparkled the idea to do some research. At that time, you know, there was almost no research on these products. So it was something very new. Um, I started doing some work and that's, you know, how it evolved to a um, full-time uh, research work now on uh, tobacco harm reduction, expanding beyond, beyond electronic cigarettes to the whole uh, prospect and strategy of tobacco harm reduction because it's a collection of different things and different products that can be used. Right now I'm a senior researcher at the University of Patras and at the School of Public Health at the University of Western uh, Attica. Um, additionally, last year on, um, on November 2019, I was uh, declared the highly cited researcher, which is um, a very small group of approximately 0.1% of scientists with the highest impact on um, um, in global science. Uh, uh, that's based on um, uh, citations from others. So it's not based on self-citation uh, in uh, 21 scientific fields. So it's not only public health or medicine, but it's a broader um, science um, um, uh, pro uh, aspect uh, involving, I mean, from physics, medicine, uh, computer science, you know, whatever you can imagine, 21 scientific fields. And that was coming from my research on tobacco harm reduction. So that's why I mentioned that because it's very relevant to our discussion. Um, can you, in very simple and brief terms, explain what studies you have published with regards to smoking slash nicotine and COVID-19 this year and try to make it understandable for us amateurs? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a bit hard because, uh, you know, these are very technical terms, but I'll do my best. So um, it all started from um, um, an observation uh, that uh, while we were expecting uh, smoking to be really a risk factor for um, developing severe COVID, uh, what appeared to happen from um, case series published firstly from China was that the prevalence of smokers who were among uh, patients hospitalized for COVID-19 was uh, extremely low. Uh, and that um, uh, seemed like a paradox. And you know that China is uh, a country with a very high prevalence of smoking, especially among men. About 50% of men smoke there. Yeah. Uh, and that was a consistent observation. Um, one after the other, the case series were coming out with very low prevalence of uh, smoking among hospitalized COVID-19 patients. And that seemed like a paradox, especially when you also consider that um, uh, other risk factors for severe COVID are also outcomes of smoking, uh, adverse health outcomes of smoking, such as cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease. So uh, based on that, you were expecting that smokers would have been overrepresented among hospitalized patients, but instead they were underrepresented. Uh, over time, 
case series from other countries, uh, in the vast majority, they verified uh, the observations from Chinese case series. Uh, they also showed an underrepresentation of smokers. Uh, at the same time, um, among those who were hospitalized, smokers were having a higher risk of uh, having a bad outcome, die or suffer from uh, serious complications. And that's not paradoxical and not contradictory to the low prevalence of uh, smoking among hospitalized patients. It just means that um, very few smokers get hospitalized for COVID, but among those very few, uh, among this minority of smokers, they have a higher risk of developing serious complications. It's not contradictory at all, uh, but it doesn't mean that all smokers have a higher risk. It means that only a very small group of smokers, smaller than what would be expected, um, uh, have a higher risk. And it's very important to clarify that. So um, since I, I, I uh, observed that, and that was in late ma uh, March uh, of this year, I, may, I, I published my first uh, analysis in a pre-publication. And on April 3rd, I remember the date, uh, for the first time, I mentioned the hypothesis that nicotine, uh, most likely among the many compounds of, of cigarette smoke, nicotine is the most likely reason for uh, this observation. And I made the hypothesis that nicotine um, promotes um, the uh, control and the balance of the immune system because we know that serious COVID-19 is basically a an immune system dysregulation and the loss of balance of the immune system. So there is a hyperinflammatory response that cannot be controlled. So the inflammatory response, which is a defense system of the, of the organism, is in reality attacking uh, the body tissues. Um, over time, we started working. Yeah. Um, yeah, I hear you, Ben. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll try to, to make it simple. I mean, I'm an amateur, I'm not a scientist. I'm a tobacco harm reduction advocate and an inventor, but is it so that you believe uh, or have a hypothesis that the, the, the COVID-19 receptors could somehow be blocking the receptors of the virus? Yeah, that, that would have been my second part. Uh, so after these observations, we try to find mechanisms to um, identify the mechanisms involved in such a potentially protective role, because we need to clarify that until now, nothing has been clinically proven. So we're talking about potential interactions. So what we found through uh, three-dimensional modeling, we had some biologists do some modeling uh, which means that they take the structures of different molecules and different uh, things and they try to see if there is interaction and interaction between them. Uh, we identified that it is possible that the virus itself, the spike protein of the virus, which is the uh, protruding part of the virus, the one that attaches to the cells, you know, it's like an antenna, something like that. Yeah, 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 something yeah. like that. <laughs> You, you may have seen the images of the virus. So these, yeah. these protruding, uh, let's call it antennas, for people to understand. Um, these are the um, parts that attach to the cell, and then they attack the cell. Uh, we found that some parts on the surface of these antennas um, may interact with the nicotinic receptors. Uh, every all, Many cells in the human body uh, contain these receptors and uh, the immune system also contains these receptors. And one of the um, um, uh, functions of these receptors is to regulate and modulate the immune system. So um, we identified such a potential interaction. And what that means is that the virus may... Um, uh, inhibit the function of these receptors and by doing that they may um, dysregulate the immune system. So this is the hypothesis that we have built that there is a direct effect of the virus, an adverse effect 
on these nicotinic receptors. By doing this, they uh, create a dysfunction in the immune system. And now the role of nicotine is, and that's why they are called nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, because nicotine um, works on them, attaches on these receptors, and promotes their function. So nicotine could compete with the virus and in that effect protect these receptors from an adverse uh, direct effect of the virus. Could, could you say like if, if this is the body of the virus and you have the spikes, the receptors, could you compare it to, uh, let's say you have, you place 10 chairs around the table, a game I used to play when I was a child. And then you have nine, uh, nine people, you know, uh, sitting down. It makes it harder for, for anyone else to sit down on the, on the chairs. Yes, imagine that, um, you know, we've, uh, we've made this discovery by comparing uh, parts of the virus with um, um, snake venom toxins. And the reason is that snake venom toxins are the best known uh, uh, compounds, proteins, that attack uh, these receptors and inhibit their function. And that's how it started. We found some parts of the virus that resemble these toxins. And we then found through the 3D structural modeling that this part of the virus can attach to these receptors. So if we, we want to use this, this chair game as a comparison, yes, imagine that the virus can sit on the chair, but when you have nicotine, you have some people that sit on the chair uh, and prevent the virus from sitting on the chair because there is no place for the virus to sit. Um, you know that these... Um, the, the snake venom toxins are also inhibited and prevented from attaching to these receptors by nicotine. These are studies that have been performed since the 70s, you know, we know that. And this is the same way that we think that nicotine is going to uh, prevent the virus from attaching to these receptors. And not only nicotine, but other nicotinic agonists, we call the uh, substance that promote the function of these receptors agonists, um, so imagine that the spike is an antagonist, it prevents this uh, receptor from working, and nicotine is an agonist, it promotes the function of these receptors. So what we think is happening is that nicotine prevents the virus from having adverse effect, uh, an adverse effect on these receptors. Thank you very much for the clarification. Let, let's move on to uh, the Swedish study now. Uh, scientists in Sweden at the CES, the Center of Epidemiology and Social Medicine, has gathered a, a big team to, uh, to investigate in Sweden, perhaps the only country where you can do this type of investigation. They are uh, going to uh, use uh, the Swedish dental registry of the Folktanvården, <laughs> uh, which covers, they're going to extract uh, information from about 150,000 people, where about 12,000 people are smokers and 15,000 people are snooze users. Um, and they're going to extract the data, fresh data, from patients going to the dentist between the period September to January 2020, September 2019. And uh, what I didn't know, and I don't think anybody, uh, most people in Sweden don't know, is that we, our tobacco use is registered in our patient's journal when we go to the dentist. And most people in Sweden go to the dentist once a year. So with this cohort, 150,000 people is, is quite a lot of uh, people, I mean. They are going to compare <clears throat> the, uh, the COVID infected among smokers, snooze users, and non-nicotine users and compare this 
to the database of the approximately 80,000 people in Sweden so far that has uh, a positive uh, COVID-19 diagnosis. I mean, they have been infected by the virus. And they're also going to use uh, uh, other registries. We, have, we are very good at having registries in, in Sweden. There's a database of snooze users uh, stretching from the beginning of the 70s to the end of the 1990s, covering about three to 400,000 construction workers. Uh, oh, they just uh, released the Karolinska Institute in, in May. They released a report saying that there is no increased relative risk of, of getting oral cancer from Swedish snooze as a matter of fact. Yes, yes, it was a very recent study. Yeah, as a, as a matter of fact, a, a quote from the study saying that normal snooze use, which is like, uh, you know, five cans per week, uh, has a 21% lower risk to, to get oral cancer than non-users of snooze. Uh, my question to you <clears throat> is, uh, what do you think we can expect in terms of result from this uh, very huge uh, Swedish scientific study? Well, I think that I'm as exciting uh, as you are. Um, we definitely wanted to see um, the use of nicotine by uh, through products beyond smoking because we should clarify for everyone that we do not suggest that smoking has a protective role against COVID-19 or anything else because smoking is associated with well-known um, adverse health effects, uh, both short-term and long-term. And that's why it cannot be used as a protective factor uh, for anything. But um, it is ideal to examine the effects of nicotine uh, through the use of other products. And snooze is one product uh, that is by far less harmful than smoking and at the same time delivers nicotine at levels very similar to um, uh, or even higher than uh, smoking. So it is... Uh, an ideal situation. It's very, a very positive sign that they're looking at it. Uh, what we need to see is, uh, and the difference between smoking and snooze use, uh, and also between a cigarette and snooze use, is that with snooze you don't obtain, you don't absorb nicotine through uh, inhalation. And we know that COVID-19 is basically a disease of the respiratory system. And it is possible that inhaling nicotine may have better effects than obtaining nicotine systematically through uh, another route, uh, because you, you will have higher levels of nicotine, higher concentrations of nicotine locally into the respiratory system. And this is where uh, most of the inflammatory uh, procedures processes are happening when you are suffering from COVID. So it is possible that the uh, local effects may be even more pronounced, uh, and we will not see that with snooze. But I think that snooze is a product, uh, knowing its very low risk profile, uh, I think that it is an ideal product to look at. And um, knowing that Scandinavia, and especially Sweden, has a very high rate of uh, nicotine use but most of it is coming from uh, snooze instead of smoking. This is a big difference compared to any other European country. So it's ideal that um, they will be looking at this and the effects of nicotine through snooze use uh, in Sweden. I was very happy when this was announced and I'm really eager to, um, um, eagerly waiting for the results to come up. I think the whole world is... Uh will be uh, interested in the outcomes uh, of this. I, I heard some of the anti-COVID-19 medicines for intensive care patients costs about 40,000 Swedish krona, 4,000 euro per, 
patient. So, uh, and, uh, yes, it's not only a matter of cost. Let me clarify that nicotine is something that you can use even at home. We have many smoking cessation medications, NRTs, that can be used at home. Um, it is very convenient to be used. It is also quite safe to be used even by non-smokers in, in case we find some uh, benefit uh, from clinical studies or from observational cohort studies. Uh, it is quite safe. You just need to slowly uptitrate the dose. But uh, nicotine has been administered to non-smokers uh, in several studies and there were no serious side effects. There was not even any um, dependence uh, afterwards and it has been administered for several weeks. You would not need it for several weeks in the case of COVID. It would be a much shorter uh, period of administration. So I think that it is, um, if it is proven effective, it's going to be a very um, uh, efficient um, uh, therapeutic um, um, uh, product because it can be used both by smokers and by non-smokers uh, with some precautions, of course, as with any medication. But the prospects are there. We just need to look at clinical efficacy first. So we are not saying to anyone that go to a pharmacy and get nicotine replacement therapies or start smoking, of course not. Uh, uh, but um, if we find clinical evidence that it is effective, then it can be used by everyone, not, not only by smokers, not only by snooze users or uh, users of other types of nicotine products. And that's very, very important in um, the combat against the COVID-19. In, in the, <clears throat> when uh, <clears throat> the CES, the Center of, DC, of uh, Epidemiology and uh, Social Disease, announced uh, was Professor uh, Cecilia Magnusson and uh, Rosaria Galanti, also a professor, when they asked uh, Cecilia Magnusson, uh, when asked what snooze users should do if it turns out that snooze slash nicotine has a protective effect against COVID-19, uh, the professor Magnusson answered, it is conceivable that nicotine can be used as a treatment for COVID-19. It is also conceivable that people who are considering stop snooze use in the current situation may choose to wait uh, with it until after the pandemic. So uh, when we use snus, which is a 200 year old Swedish uh, oral tobacco product, uh, we, we sort of keep it for an hour at a time under our upper lip. It, it's, it's very discreet and, and it doesn't disturb anybody else. But could the I mean, if nicotine would have some kind of protective effect, theoretically, against uh, getting COVID-19, could the, the time that you administer the nicotine have, could there be a difference between smoking, which is very unhealthy in itself, and uh, snooze use? Because when you smoke, you smoke for five minutes. When you use a snooze, you use it for an hour at a time. So it has a, like a continuous dose of nicotine. Yeah, continuous, uh, continuous nicotine intake is not necessarily a good thing because we also have a, a desensitization of the receptors. And with snooze, yeah, it's, it's more prolonged. But again, you're not taking one pouch after the other. So you still have um, some time in between pouches that the uh, blood nicotine levels go down and then they come up again when you take uh, the, the next pouch. So, um, of course, with smoking, you have um, much more uh, peaks and throats. Uh, so um, uh, many more um, uh, spikes of increasing nicotine concentration and then decreasing nicotine concentration. They're happening much faster. Uh, this is also something that makes smoking very uh, addictive. Uh, 
these sudden changes in um, uh, and large changes in nicotine concentrations, yes. Uh, and this is happening characteristically with smoking. Um, it, it's still too early to judge uh, on many things like the mode of delivery, the route of delivery, the uh, amount and whether it should be continuous or not. Um, you know, with NRTs, unfortunately, and let's say with patches, uh, patches have a characteristic, you know, uh, stable concentration uh, throughout the day. Uh, and you just take it off in the evening so you have some hours without nicotine until the next day when you take the next uh, patch. Uh, perhaps that's not the ideal way of doing that. With snooze, yes, you have more prolonged levels, but you do have some, uh, again, decreases and increases again, uh, depending on how you use the pouches. Uh, with these cigarettes, you also have some um, ups and downs not at the same level usually as smoking because with e-cigarettes you also use it um, on, uh, on a more prolonged time throughout the day because it's more practical to do that you know you just take one puff and you uh, can stop with a tobacco cigarette once you light up a cigarette you need to consume the whole cigarette so you are obliged to smoke for five minutes for the time <laughs> you, you consume the cigarette you know you, just, you can't just take one puff and stop you're going to waste the cigarette uh, yeah. But it's still too early. I think we are still at a time where we are looking, desperately looking for some clinical evidence. Uh, we do have some studies which are showing that even that smoking uh, uh, reduces the risk of uh, being infected with the virus, which is something really uh, strange and really interesting that we need to, to see. But I think that uh, we need to develop more clinical data. We're also doing some in vitro work. But you know, it's clinical data that are going to dictate um, uh, the use of these uh, products in the clinical setting. So yeah. anything we see is, is very important, including the clinical trials that have been, uh, um, that are underway or are going to be started, initiated soon, uh, when uh, people will be administered uh, nicotine, um, usually in the form of a patch. Patch is, yeah. yes, but uh, we'll see. It was actually uh, the French scientists who are now uh, about to conduct the, uh, the clinical trials with uh, nicotine patches and uh, placebo. It's a yes, they have announced it. I don't know if they have started yet. Uh, you know, clinical studies take time. To, to, to be completed uh, it's not something that you expect the result within a month so we need to be patient i mean yeah there are I, I i have uh, another question the uh, swedish professor in charge of the snooze slash nicotine uh, covid 19 studies she uh, she has been quoted uh, earlier in this podcast as saying that, i quoting now, we say that each life is worth about 1 million Swedish krona, which is equal to about 100,000 euro. From a prevention point of view, for example, traffic safety. Uh, if we would apply this uh, price per head, on the Swedish experience of snooze, where uh, Dr. Lars Ramström in 2016 concluded that about 86% of Swedish snooze users were former smokers who quit smoking uh, for good. I mean, if we apply the formula of one million, uh, it would come to some kind of prevention profit of, of 1,000 billion Swedish krona. Now, uh, regardless of the price per head uh, or life saved, if you like, uh, why do you think the subject of tobacco harm reduction is so controversial, not to say infected to many health authorities and governments around the world? Well, I think there is a problem starting with the terminology. It should have been smoking uh, um, control and smoking harm reduction. 
The second is that the tobacco control community, I mean, large parts of it, not everyone, um, has, um, is now oriented more towards um, nicotine prohibition rather than eliminating smoking. Uh, and that's really uh, unfortunate because um, in their efforts and, um, you know, I would call it also an obsession or even a, a hysteria to uh, eliminate nicotine use, um, they have um, basically uh, reduced their focus uh, and they have deviated their focus from smoking, which is, which is the killer. <laughs> it's not nicotine that kills smokers. It's the uh, combustion process and the combustion products. So, um, um, and I think that it is a move which is totally unrealistic. Um, they prefer to sacrifice smokers in order to have a nicotine-free future, which is unlikely to happen in any case, rather than to look at the problem which is smoking and uh, understand that alternative nicotine sources are going to promote the elimination of smoking rather than propagate smoking. Um, the problem that they are seeing, which in my opinion is not a problem, is that they don't want people to use nicotine, uh, irrespective of the product you use to obtain nicotine. And I don't understand that because it goes beyond the principles of public health, because public health is about promoting the well-being and reducing disease and death. And if nicotine does not cause death or has a minimal contribution to deaths, then it shouldn't be the uh, job of public health. Uh, it should be uh, the job of perhaps ethics, if there is any ethical issue, any moral issue using nicotine, because unlike uh, other substances such as opiates, uh, nicotine use is perfectly compatible with the very normal social and personal life. You know, it doesn't destroy uh, the social and personal life of people in the same way that opiates uh, destroy it because they alter the consciousness. Well, nicotine, if anything, promotes concentration um, and uh, it works a bit like caffeine and it is perfectly compatible with having a, a normal social, personal and uh, professional life. Uh, so I don't see any moral and I don't see any public health issues with using nicotine besides the fact, of course, of smoking, which is the cause of the disease. So uh, smokers, you know, they, they want to take uh, obtain nicotine. Of course, there's a lot of um, the habituation, the habit of smoking is also promoting the addictiveness, but it's not the nicotine that kills these people. So why are we focusing on nicotine? There is no reason for that. Uh, or let me, let, me, let me correct that. There is minimal reason. Uh, there is minimal harm. Let's, let's not say that nicotine is perfectly harmless, but there is minimal harm. So we should focus on the real harm, which is smoking. Uh, it's definitely safer to travel in, a, you know, a, a, an army tank than to bicycle without a helmet. <laughs> Uh, you know, um, it's it's but, like no. it's like it's like ignoring that uh, safe belts uh, are needed because you know safe belts give a false impression of safety to the people and they will it will promote driving and driving by itself is dangerous and you can get injured or even die uh, even if you wear a seat belt. But yeah. no one has used this argument against seatbelts. It makes zero sense. I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense at all, you know. I, I agree totally with you. Um, another question. If uh, epidemiology data and clinical trials data would prove that nicotine is in fact reducing the risk of, uh, you know, becoming COVID-19 infected, and or having, uh, you know, more severe outcomes of the virus. Do you think this could have uh, implications for uh, far less uh, harmful products than smoking, such as 
snooze, e-cigarettes, nicotine pouches, heat not burn and other products with regards to legislation and the present ban on snooze in the European Union? Well, I hope it will because um, uh, even if nicotine is proven to be effective, uh, we need to convince smokers to quit. But in that case, we would need to tell them that they shouldn't quit nicotine intake. And how are they going to get nicotine when they quit smoking? Well, of course, one option, and I would say the best option is to use medications, NRTs, but NRTs will not work for the vast majority. So we need to have more alternative nicotine-containing products that really a, a mistake to tell these people that they should quit nicotine intake. Of course, we should, uh, again, encourage them to quit smoking, but we should provide them with other nicotine-containing products. And we should make a, um, um, uh, we should give them our recommendations that yes, NRTs are probably the best option, but if you cannot quit with that, you should have other alternatives. Now for uh, the EU ban on snooze, I have called this one of the biggest public health uh, scandals uh, ever in the European Union. It makes absolutely no sense. It's just, it is just right now, I think there's no doubt, it is just a political uh, decision that politicians are too uh, selfish to take it back. Uh, and it's only that. There is no science behind that. There is no common sense behind that. Uh, in fact, it is absolutely rational. Uh, it is extremely disappointing that the European Court did not realize that. And it's even more disappointing that some, um, sorry for saying that, but laughable arguments were used for their decisions, such as that uh, Swedish men have low smoking rates because they take paternity leave. This is absolutely <laughs> laughable, uh, and, but unfortunately it was used as one of the main arguments for um, maintaining the ban. Uh, it is seriously a public health scandal, and I don't know how, how this will be reverted. It is a very um, bad service to the EU uh, population. I, I, I was actually there together with my snooze friend, Uwe Hille from Germany, uh, during the trial hearing in the European Court of Justice. And uh, another argument used by the EU lawyers was that uh, it, it's, it's, it has nothing to do with snooze that the Swedish men have stopped smoking. It, it has to do with the Swedish men's healthy living style. <laughs> And, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. To but totally 20 years ago it was very different. Yeah, they totally forgot about the women. Which... It doesn't even ma it doesn't even matter. Uh, Swedish men who have a very high rate of nicotine use, but most of it is snus, they are having three times lower death rates from cardiovascular disease, lung uh, cancer, and other types of cancer compared to uh, the average in the European Union. That says something by itself. They are ignoring the evidence. There is no argument for the ban. Uh, it's just legal games, unfortunately, and political games, unfortunately, which are uh, depriving smokers for a, a less harmful alternative. In fact, smokers in Europe, outside Scandinavia, they almost know nothing about snus almost nothing. And don't forget, snus is the only nicotine product with the highest level of evidence from epidemiology on its low uh, harm. We're not talking about a low harm potential, we're talking about proven uh, minimal harm from long-term uh, epidemiological studies in humans. It's not in vitro, it's not modeling, it's truly hardcore evidence, and it's the only product that has such hardcore evidence. So it is even more unacceptable that the EU is not even considering this, uh, this highest level evidence for SNUS. 
Now, um, just last year in October, the uh, Federal Drug Administration, FDA in, in the USA, approved SNUS as the first ever um, modified risk tobacco product. So that should say something. And it took them a long time, longer than needed, <laughs> let me tell you. Yeah, it, it took them a long time. Uh, it's true what you say. I mean, Sweden has the lowest uh, smoking prevalence in, in all of the European Union and yes among... but very high but very high nicotine prevalence the yep. uh, nicotine Same. use prevalence is not lower than other countries so no, this it's... is another argument and another I mean clear evidence uh, for the minimal harm caused by nicotine when you don't take it through a product that involves combustion that that's very true we we are on the average of uh, total nicotine consumption in Sweden, but we we uh, use snooze much more than than we smoke. Yes, and, yes. and and we have uh, just repeating what you said. We have the lowest prevalence of uh, most cancer forms: uh, lung cancer, oral cancer, and cardiovascular diseases, uh, as well as the lowest more tobacco mortality in the European Union, perhaps even uh, in the world. I know Iceland is also low. But uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Farsalinos. Uh, I would just like to finish with uh, a personal uh, question. Have, you, have, yeah. you ever, have you ever tried Swedish news? If you have, what did you experience? <laughs> yes, I have tried it uh, twice and um, I had to remove the pouch after five minutes because of the uh, burning sensation, uh, which was quite unpleasant for me. Uh, so it, the, the, the problem for me was the burning sensation uh, under the upper lip. Uh, that's what uh, made me, you know, remove the pouch. I didn't have any other issue. I don't know what would happen if I would keep it for longer time, but um, the main thing that annoyed me was the burning sensation. Uh, but I was pretty much unfamiliar with snus. I mean, I know the product, but I've never tried it before. So I've only tried it twice. All right. Thank you very much for your time, uh, Dr. Farsalinos. And, uh, Thank you. Uh, and uh, hope to see you again. And maybe we can discuss the results from the Swedish scientists once uh, it comes becomes public certainly certainly thank you very much thank you very much bye bye bye